Welcome to the First Things First podcast. And first things first, we need you to subscribe and leave comments letting us know what you think of the show. We're listening. I'm Nick Wright, joined by two of my favorite people, Jenna Wolf, Chris Carter. Now let's get the show started. Oh, good morning. Welcome to First Things First. I'm Jenna Wolf. That is the Hall of Famer, Chris Carter. That's Nick Wright. This time Monday morning, we're going to know who's in the Super Bowl. Yes, we will. All year long, we've talked about it. Yes. It's our last show we do without knowing it. I'm so excited. This is what we look like without having Super Bowl knowledge. Exactly right. And this is what Chris looks like after being poisoned by his co-host. Oh, oh right. Okay. We, can, we, can do, we, we will get to that at some point in these three hours. Is if he General here? Wolf offers is he here? you candy or food product, <laughs> make sure you check out the details, <laughs> okay. country of origin, okay. and expiration date. Sometimes your intelligence backfires, uh-huh. yeah. okay? This isn't one of them. <laughs> he's here, and he's alive. You are here, and you're alive. And really, at the end of the day, when the bar is that low, <laughs> that's, that's all, all that, that matters. matters. My stomach hurts like Tom Brady's hand. Okay, okay. <laughs> Speaking of the hand of Tom Brady, if you are the Patriots quarterback and you bang your hand in practice days before the AFC title game, it's not that big a deal. If you're limited in practice on Wednesday, as a result, kind of a big deal. If you miss practice Thursday and the line starts to move towards Jacksonville's favor, more of a big deal. Good thing they've got a backup quarterback in case of emergency. Oh, wait, hold on a second. (laughs) Cece, should we be concerned now that Tom Brady has missed practice Thursday and was limited on Wednesday? I'm a big practice guy. And any time that I see a guy's practicing, um, sometimes it's warranted. Sometimes the, the coach is going to give a player a certain time. There's bumps and bruises, especially on Wednesday. Coaches are a little more lenient. Training staff is a little more lenient. But when we get to this time of the year, because timing is so crucial and being with your teammates on the field, all guys who can practice, they practice as much as, 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 as their body allows them to. Tom Brady is a workout fanatic. He loves watching film. He loves being on the practice field with his teammates. So it's easier for me to to jump to a conclusion with Tom because I've seen this. Other guys, I I wouldn't be as concerned about. But Tom, I know he wants to get every snap. Tom even wants to take the kneel down at the end of game. So I know it's very important if he gets dinged on a Wednesday practice. And then he misses part or most of the Thursday practice. Of course, I'm going to be concerned because Wednesday and Thursday is where they do most of the installation and most of the running. On Friday, it's just more maintenance, throwing out some things. They don't throw the ball as much. Now, Tom has more experience than anyone that's ever played this game. Now, he's going to need it, especially if he's banged up. But if he's banged up, watch for New England to change their game plan. Either watch for him try to throw the ball really short, either sideways, um, horizontally compared to vertically, and watch for him to try to run the ball because even though Tom's hand might be banged up, they know they're playing against Blake Bortles. So they're going to have a game plan that I believe is going to reflect that Tom's hand was injured in practice, and we're going to see a very, very different game plan, I think, come Sunday by Tom Brady and the Patriots. Before I give my opinion on this, I just want to follow up with a question for you on that. How hard is it to change the game plan Thursday? It's not that hard for New England. Okay. Because they have a variance of game plans going in. Like, they might have come out and started throwing the ball, but saying we're going to get the lead, then eventually we're going to run the ball. And they are more game-specific, injury-specific, you know, if they don't have Gronk, what they're going to do, if they don't have a James White. So it's easier for them to adjust than other teams. So that right there makes you have less concern because it's New England. All right, so I want to – I'm the resident gambling guy on the show. Vegas did take note of this. Vegas took note of this. The line moved more from Wednesday to Thursday – then the line would have moved if Rob Gronkowski was ruled out of the game. Wow. The line moved a point and a half, two points in some spots. Gronk's worth between a point and a point and a half. So this was a significant line move from the Pats to nine, nine and a half and point And tell favorites. people what that means. That's the people are people, shifting well, where they're betting. All of a sudden, a lot of money came in on Jacksonville. Now, maybe that was just Joe Public who mm-hmm. saw our show, saw Skip and Shannon, said, oh, my God, Brady hurt his hand and might be broken. Let me bet a bunch of money on the Jags. Or maybe it's sharp betters. Maybe it's people with information saying, oh, there's now value on the Jaguars but the the line moving that much with one thing changing to me makes it noteworthy Brady then missing practice 
So I knew the line move before I knew Brady missed practice. That Brady then missing practice compounds it. But I also have to say, the Pats, if Brady had to play left-handed, then this quarterback matchup's a draw because they're up against Blake Bortles. This game's in Gillette. They have had, they are, the Jags are coming off consecutive, very difficult playoff games, very different playoff games. The first one was a slugfest 10-3. The second one, a a, a high-scoring duel. The Patriots, meanwhile, had a week off and then blew out the Titans. This is no, if you thought the Pats were going to win prior to this, prior to this, to me, this is not reason to change your opinion. The Pats, in my eyes, are still heavy favorites going into this football game because of the experience, because of where the game is, and because this is no one thinks Brady's not going to play. No one thinks Brady's going to be out of the football game, just maybe not quite as effective as you would have hoped he could be. Question for you. Just if we talk about him changing the game plan, what does it mean for the way, and I don't know this, the way you, you grip the football? Because you throw, right, with sort of with your fingertips. So what is the, the fact that your thumb is injured? Does that affect the distance he can throw, the velocity that he can throw? Right. They haven't been specific as far as it. Is it the hand? Is it a thumb or a finger? If his thumb, which a lot yeah, of they, quarterbacks yeah, hurt their thumbs more so, when they're throwing because they release, their thumb goes down, and it typically hits someone's helmet. So it's typically some type of bone bruise. hope it's not the same bruise as Sam, Sam Bradford because enough he's going to lose his hand. But <laughs> it's things for a couple days, and I could see from a caution standpoint, also it makes sense why they had an X-ray. All right. If there was some immediate swelling, immediately get an X-ray at the facility to to to, to make sure that you know that it's not broken, and then the next day you're going to keep it compressed to make sure that the swelling and try to get it to die down before game day. New England is very very fortunate. It's going to be unseasonably warm this weekend, yes. and that is going to help. If it had been the normal in the 20s, wind chill in the teens, that would affect a quarterback's hand more so. And anytime you see Tom Brady wearing a glove, because he does not like to wear a, gar- a glove, that's an alarm, too, right there, that something is a little bit different than what we're used to seeing. Or that they want to cover up whatever it is and not let anyone see. And I know you think Mother Nature as well as the refs and everyone else is well, no, rooting well, for the Patriots. Well, so I, there you I, go, I, Nick. The, I don't know. I don't, I don't know who's rooting for the Pats, but I do know this. We thought it being unseasonably warm 48 hours ago. That was good for the Jags. Right. That all of a sudden the Jags aren't going to have to deal with the elements. It's interesting now with this. It could tilt it to where the Patriots are happy about this. I, I can't hear this though, and not think about what was the biggest story of the Patriots' regular season, which is trading Jimmy Garoppolo. Like, I the, I understand they have to deal with where they're at right now. I understand Brian Hoyer's their backup quarterback. He has experience in the system. But this is a team that doesn't carry three quarterbacks, that had, without question, going into this year, the best quarterback situation in the league, the league's best backup quarterback, and a third stringer who has shown he can start games and win games for multiple teams in this league. To go from that to be in the AFC Championship game where Brian Hoyer is who hasn't taken a meaningful snap for the Patriots in years. Where Brian Hoyer's your backup quarterback, yeah, but it does make me think about not only that the article about why Garoppolo was traded, the timing where he was traded, that entire circumstance. See, see what would have to happen for Brian Hoyer to be playing football on Sunday? Oh, a disaster. They didn't send something from North Korea, and it's then hit us <laughs> if he gets in the game. I mean, it's... I, I, so he's going to play with his thumb like this. I mean, he, they have to be – could, could he be playing and I mean, they're losing forget, so badly they pull him? Uh, let's no. not forget, Tom Brady is a football player, all right? He's going to be out there. That's his team, all right? It's his legacy at stake, all right? Let's not get carried away. If he can't play, if he can't grip the football, Bill and them are going to make the best decision for the football team, just like they do anything else. Tom Brady will get a chance to play. Now can Jacksonville take advantage – of the injury, and he's going to be very fortunate because it's a lot easier to grip the football when it's above freezing, which is going to be on time. Look, I'm no drama queen, but Patriots backup quarterback Brian Hoyer practiced in Brady's place because of that injured hand. And at last check, Jimmy Garoppolo is enjoying his offseason. <laughs> New England is favored by more than a touchdown in this one. So what chance do the Jags have here? Head coach Doug Marone got some interesting advice on this. Um, <laughs> want to beat the Patriots? Here's how. Advice from your number one fans, the Bulls first grade. That's the one thing I will say about this week. It's kind of throwing me off. 
Do you find time to go through I find it hard to believe how so many people have an opinion on how to beat the New England Patriots, and no one's really have, has, have done that. <laughs> <laughs> so give it up to the first grade class of Bowles School, who gave Marone a whole packet with advice to taking down the Pats. That's all. CC so advice from grade schoolers aside, and it's adorable, really. I'm surprised mo more schools haven't done this in and around the Jacksonville area. What is the key to this matchup? Well, they haven't been in the championship game, I think, since 99. So <laughs> <laughs> the kids have gone on to college. <laughs> yeah, so. The last kids to write those letters yes. were the parents of the kids right. writing these yeah. letters. Right, right, right. I mean, uh, Doug Marone is, is right that it is hard to come up with a calculated, educated, realistic plan to beat New England, especially in playoff games in Foxborough. But the one thing that Jacksonville has on its side, and I know Doug Marone is, is, is preaching this to Jacksonville. There's been four times you had this type of matchup where you had the NFL's leading passer against the number one pass defense. In the, it's happened since 1990. This will be the fourth time. If Doug Marone, if he's on the right side of history, they will be 4-0 after this game because the number one defense has shut down the number one passer in the three previous times. They're 3-0. So the path to victory is this defense. Defense wins championships. Our boy Ray Lewis talks about that's what got him two championships. Jacksonville's path to victory is by shutting down Tom, making them one-dimensional, which they might be if he has a serious hand injury, and creating turnovers. That's the only way you're going to be able to beat New England, and that's especially the only way that you're going to be able to beat them in Foxborough. So I know everyone's going to focus on strength versus strength. Patriots offense against Jags defense. It's the most interesting matchup. It involves Tom Brady. It involves all the great characters and players on the Jags defense. I want to flip it around just for a moment. Because here's what we know about the Patriots offense. They're getting to 20 points. They get to 20. They, over the last three years in games that Brady's played the whole all the way through, they've been held under 19 twice. In three years. In the last three years, it's happened twice, held under 19. Once a 16-3 to win against Denver, where they really took their foot off the gas oh, yeah. last year, they probably could have scored more, and won a 20-18 to loss to Denver in the AFC Championship game a couple years ago. So Denver's the only team that's held Tom Brady under 19 points in the last three seasons. So the reason I mention that is the Jags even can play great. Offense still got to get to 20. Or the team as a whole still has to get to 20. I don't think you can hold this Patriots. I don't think you can beat this Patriots team no matter how good your defense is 13-6. to six. Remember when Ray was out here and I asked him, how many points did you guys feel like you guys needed? And he said three. We only needed three. And while that seemed hyperbolic, that team only allowed 10 points right. per game. This Jags defense, best defense in the NFL, they still allow 16 points per game. That's on league average. The Patriots will get to their 20. So how can the Jags get to the, that point total? To me, that is almost the underrated key of this football game, and I don't see them being able to do that unless Leonard Fournette has a massive football game. They can do it with the defense. Defense could create turnovers. They could score a touchdown. They could put them in field goal range to, with a field goal. I think one of the major differences differences is Pittsburgh's defense was not great in the red zone. They did not slow down Jacksonville. I believe New England's defense, they will tighten up. Jacksonville might get some yards on them, but they are exceptional in the red zone. So those trips, if Jacksonville has one less trip in the red zone yesterday where they converted to a touchdown, they lose to Pittsburgh. Right, but they when they got into the red zone, they got touchdowns, and that was a huge part to the game. Because at the end, Absolutely. you know, that was a, a, a big difference. So New England, people that say they don't like their defense, they give up a lot of yards. Man, it's points. How many points will they be able to negate one from the red zone? Who's had the most success against the, the Patriots in the Super Bowl in, in the last couple of years? The, the, Giants. the Giants and Tom Coughlin. How much of this week is going to be about Doug Marone knocking on Tom Coughlin's I, door? And I understand Blake Bortles is no Eli Manning, but how much is going to be like, okay, you game planned against Tom Brady and a, a good portion of that offense? I, I want to make a point on that because I've heard so many people bring up that exact point. The Giants. What's the Giants' methodology? What was the Broncos' methodology? It seems to me their methodology of beating the Patriots is – it's nothing special about the Patriots or those teams. It's about the personnel they had. Because what's their methodology? Get to the quarterback without having to send extra guys. Get to the quarterback with a four-man rush. CeCe, tell me if I'm wrong. 
Isn't that every team's hope? Isn't that every yeah, game plan? Yeah, but the plan? Giants made no. it work, and everyone goes in trying no, to do that. No, every team can't do that. <laughs> Agreed. Every team does not have Pro Bowl corners. Every team does not have the type of rushers that they had that, that compiled the type of sacks. So, no, they, they want to – I mean, they say they want to get pressure, but they know they got a blitz to get pressure. So, no, every team's job is not to say, we're going to rush forward today because they know they can't get there. Go ahead, Jenner. I was going to say, then how, how did the Giants figure out a way to well, do they, it? They had the guys. They had the personnel, which is why – The NASCAR me, package. The, the, right. They yep. could put 4 D. Go ahead. Yep. They could put – they could have a rotation of seven guys, and when they got to third down and long, they put in almost all speed guys. But the combination of what they had up front and their linebackers in, man, they were physical in the secondary. They realized you had to bump these guys off the line of scrimmage. So collectively, the front end tied up with the back end, and that's what led to the victory. And you don't see hints of that with this Jackson? No, I, I absolutely do see hints of that because of the the point that I'm making is a lot of people are drawing the Tom Coughlin comparison. I think Chris Carter could be the president of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Their game plan is going to be the same. It's about the guys. It's about whether it's Justin Tucker or Clay. The Campbell. biggest difference is when you have your voice in the room, you have proof. Tom Coughlin, I will listen to him on anything football, and especially how do you beat the Patriots? Doug Marone said it. All these people out here giving advice on how to beat the Patriots, don't nobody know better than Tom Coughlin. So you can believe Tom Coughlin, he got Clayus Campbell. He got A.J. Bouye. All these people came with Tom Coughlin. Doug Marone's physical style, it matches Tom Coughlin. If you think Doug Marone, it, man, he's a good football coach. If you're not taking advantage of the asset in Tom Coughlin, you are naive. Tom Coughlin is playing a bigger role in this game than the other two victories in the playoffs. New topic, NFC Championship game time. Philly hosting the Vikings. Shockingly, the gift shops in both Philly and Minnesota have yet to sell out their Nick Foles and Case Keenan merchandise. But, but, the jerseys that just say the word defense on the back of them are going like hotcakes. Nick Foles, Case Keenum, and two incredible defenses. CC, I ask you, what do you think the, ne the Eagles need to do to pull off the upset against Minnesota? Uh, there will be a lot of pressure on Nick Foles. It's, it's so easy. Um... You watch a lot of shows, people talk about Nick Foles, what he's got to do. But if the Eagles' defense does not play great, I don't see how the Eagles are going to win. And if Nick Foles happens to not play exceptional football, if the Eagles' defense still plays well, they still have a chance to win the game. I mean, the, you have to go back to the Saints game. People get consumed with the end of the game, Stephon Diggs. But if you watch that game, the interior of the defensive line, I mean, Cameron Jordan dominated the Vikings. The Vikings have some issues at their right tackle. So for me, looking at the defensive front, I think one of the matchups in the game is the defensive front of the Philadelphia Eagles. Jim Swartz, he loves to have a rotation. They're the only team in the NFL to have seven guys that have played over 400 snaps, and they're led by Fletcher Cox. Now, Fletcher Cox, Last week, he only played 58% of the snaps during the regular season. But he decided, listen, I am the guy. I'm getting ready to lead this defense. So he played 57 of the 63 snaps in the Atlanta game. And he dominated that football game. I know it's not sexy. People don't like to look at it. But if the Eagles are successful, regardless of what Nick Foles decides to do or not do, that defensive line, their defensive front, they can cause some chaos. Case Keenum, a little bit of a gambler, scrambles with the football. Short, has poor vision. Turnovers could lead to victory for the Eagles, led by that defensive front. So what you said there I think is really interesting. You can envision a scenario where Nick Foles doesn't play great, but the Eagles still win. You can't envision a scenario where the defense doesn't play great. But no. the Eagles still win. There's no chance for them For the to win. Eagles to win. They don't have enough firepower on their offense. They don't generate enough big plays. So I don't, I don't see that. Well, and just to amplify that point, we, when we talk about what a tough matchup the Vikings' defense is for the Eagles' offense, we've talked about how the Vikings are first or second in almost every statistical category. They're first this year in third downs, right, which is where the Eagles' offense has made hay. But I want to expand on that. They have the best third down defense in 15 years in the NFL. 
They allow the opposing team to convert less than 25% of their third downs. The best any team's done since 2002. I believe it was the 2002 Bucks, but I'm not certain. But certainly in the last 15 years. So that is, that is what... Philadelphia is up against from an offensive perspective, mm -hmm. which is why, to your point, CC, if that D line is not great, they're not going to be able to win because you. Th th this is not going to be a Steelers Jags game. This is not going to be a, a shootout. Like who the, the the way the path to victory for Philadelphia is to slow down the Eagles' offense, and the only unlike. Minnesota, or slow down Vikings, Vikings offense, pardon offense. me. The only part of the Eagles defense that I look at as elite is that D-line. I think they have good linebackers. I think they have a good secondary. But the part of the, where they have been great this year is that D-line and that rotation. I think it's really important that people understand how important the rotation is. I always, I think back to a moment in the Rams-Titans Super Bowl where they are the Titans are driving the field at the end, and one of the Rams' best defensive linemen asks out of the game. And Dick Vermeil is uh, the NFL films. He's apoplectic. He's like, "What do you do? It's two minutes left in the Super Bowl." And he said, "Coach, I can't breathe. Coach, I can't breathe." And goes to the sideline. It is so exhausting playing D-line. The constant battling if you're rushing the quarterback. So being able to constantly rotate guys in and out to have a fresh fresh pass rusher consistently is such an enormous advantage that most teams don't have because most teams just don't have enough people to do it, enough quality D linemen to do it. What's most appetizing for this Vikings defense is that uh, the Eagles defense is that Case Keenum has been sacked 19 times in the last seven games. The path is there. But it sounds like from what you guys are saying, if you negate both, not negate, but if you take both quarterbacks and say they're young and inexperienced, is this just going to come down to who's got the better defense on Sunday? It it's easy to say it's going to come down to the best defense, but Jenna, the quarterback's going to have to make three or four plays late in the game. Okay. You can't hide them, all right? Neither one of them are going to be able to run the ball in a dominant fashion. They are going to have to drop back, make a read, and they're going to have to make some tight throws into tight coverage. It's, it's not as sexy, our offensive line, defensive line. They're going to rush the passer, but these guys, we won't be able to avoid the spotlight. They will not be able to hide them on the football field on Sunday because they need explosive plays. And if not the explosive plays, who turns the ball over? Because that's big plays for the opposition. Well, and that is where, if you're rooting for the Eagles, if you're from Philly, if you bet the Eagles, whatever it is, that's the concerning point. Nick Foles has eight fumbles in seven games. Nick Foles has fumbled the ball. Mm -hmm. the, the first game he ever played this year, he took a kneel down. That was all he did. Came in, take a knee, that's it. In the seven other games where he's played, that he's actually thrown a pass, he has put the ball on the ground in every single game he's played in. So when you are talking about a team that's going to struggle to score already, if Foles turns the ball over, if the Vikings pass rush gets to him and gets a strip sack, that's the type of thing I don't think the Eagles can overcome. The Philly had been loose with the ball prior to Nick Foles. They turned the ball over in every game this year except for three instances. So if they're 70 games played, 14 games they've had a turnover. But early in the year, the offense was so high powered that it didn't, you could overcome that. It, yeah. You can overcome those types of miscues. Right now, I don't feel that way. They have to play a clean football game, which by the way, they weren't able to do against Atlanta. They no. had early turnovers against Atlanta. They yes. were just able to overcome it because the defense was so good. And when you say that these quarterbacks have to at least make three, four, five good, good, solid plays and put points on the board, I feel like that has to come early for Nick Foles because he needs some confidence early on. And this Eagles team needs an offensive jolt right off the bat, don't you think? It becomes very important. I mean, confidence begets confidence. And uh, it, you'll hear the announcers say it's important to get off to a good start. But when you don't have experience, see Tom Brady, like the Super Bowl last year, he can get off to a bad start. You know why? Because he's got a reservoir, not a film clip. He's got a reservoir of successful clips in his mind that he has been able to come back. He's seen himself doing well. But if you watched Nick Foles last week, he was so nervous when they started yeah. this game. And if you think the nerves in the divisional game or something, wait till he gets to the NFC Championship game. Now, Case Keenum, he showed more composure than Nick Foles did. I think one of the things that separates these two quarterbacks is if we're going to talk about the defenses, 
If we're going to talk about turnovers and talk over the rush, I believe the athleticism of Case Keenum gives him a huge advantage because he can get out of more trouble than Nick Foles can, but does getting out of trouble and scrambling cause him to turn the football over? That's something that I'll be watching in Sunday's contest. And that's also something that Case was much better at the first half of the year than the second half of the year. First half of the year, weeks one through nine, Case had the best sack percentage against in the league. He was only sacked on 1.6% of his dropbacks, best in the league. And a lot of that was because he was escaping. Since then, it's up to 8%. So that's partially because the offensive line hasn't been as good, partially because that escapability hasn't been quite to the elite level it was early Mm -hmm. in the year. And no team in football this year has pressured the quarterback more per game than Philly. Like, this is, you said yesterday off the air, you're like, the biggest key to this game from an Eagles perspective is something we haven't talked about much yet. We're going to get into it t- tomorrow. You didn't tell me what it was. I imagine it's that D-line against the Eagles off, or the Vikings offensive line. Absolutely. That is their, the, I don't think the Eagles have a lot of paths to victory. That's the one. The and, Eagles, the D-line dominating the Vikings O-line. And watching them struggle offensively, and especially the right tackle against New Orleans, whose line is not nearly as good and deep as Philadelphia. Either Nick Foles or Case Keenum, Eagles and Vikings starting quarterbacks, wanted to know what it would take for their football names to become household names. Well, it's an NFC title game, apparently. Nick Foles still trying to get his footing. Keenum has his footing, also his arming, a rather gunslinging side to him, not so much grip it and rip it to cross sports, but more of an ambitious side to him. Here he is describing his style of play. I play quarterback like I know how to play quarterback, and uh, it's being smart with the football but giving my guys a chance at the same time. You know, it is a fine line, and uh, you got to be smart and uh, make sure uh, you're putting your team in in a good chance to win. All right, after an entire season, we have gotten to the point where we are now breaking down Case Keenum's style of quarterbacking yeah. play. So, CC, when we say his, his gunslinger attitude, sometimes he does go out there and he, throw, and he throws a couple balls up and he's had great receivers to catch them. But is this a good or a bad thing for the Vikings? Well, the best thing for Case that he's had time. It's easier to identify what type of style a guy is if you have more than a small sample size. When you're a backup quarterback, it's hard to come up with a style because you're just trying not to lose your job. The the team is telling you not to lose the game, so you play so apprehensive that it's hard to come up with what's your style. Like, if no one's giving you a chance to develop your style in the pros, like, you don't have no style. What you was was (laughs) who you used to be. Now, Case, because of Pat Shermer, he knows Case. He understands Case. So he's allowed Case to play a game, and because their defense has been phenomenal, he has created turnovers for him, has given them a short field because they got good special team. It's allowed him to develop confidence, so which in turn his style could be exposed to the team. The team respects Case's style. They know he might throw in the traffic a little bit, but he's also thrown more big plays, contested balls, We talked about Stephon Diggs, leads the NFL in that. Yes, he puts the ball where his receivers can make a play on it. But, yes, this is is Case's style. He is short, a little bit bigger than Drew Brees, Russell Wilson-like. But he plays a lot like Brett Favre. A lot of times these guys don't get the opportunity because they don't win enough that they can be a little more cavalier with the football, that that their personalities can come out in their play. It's a great point you make that this style is typically not even a backup quarterback. It's a third-string practice squad guy because if you don't have supreme arm, arm talent or you don't have supreme measurables, if you are going to be a guy that they are not going to develop an offense around, you're just going to be, oh, our quarterback got hurt, you need you to play for a half or a game and a half. They just want you not to make mistakes. And Case was totally honest there. I have seen Case Keenum. I was in Houston when he was in college there. So I saw him set all these records. I then covered the Texans when he was there. So I've seen Case for a long time. And Case is who he is, man. He is going to run around. He is going to throw up 50-50 balls. He does not have it in him to dial it back. And that is my concern for the Vikings in this game because they don't need him to make huge plays. I don't feel they will need him to make huge plays against the Eagles. Now, if Carson Wentz were playing, I would say, hey. Of course. The, like, absolutely. You need you need a quarterback who can make a few big plays. I just and, – and by the way, Jenna, it's why his upside has been what it is. If he was just a poor man's Andy Dalton, 
instead of a homeless man's Brett Favre. If he was just like, I'm going to game manage this thing, his upside would be much lower. But you also would have less of a chance that he lose you a game. But the concern to me comes when you say, hey, here's X, which is what you've been doing for the last 13 games and to get you here. We'd like you to go in and maybe take a little bit off X. You know, just give us Y, and that should be enough. My concern is when you tell a guy who's been doing it one way, maybe back off a little or do it just a little bit differently. Don't you want him in the same exact headspace that he's been in? Yeah, I think that's what the season? Vikings coaching staff and Pat Shermer will do them. Not only is Case going there trying to win the NFC, Patrick, Pat Shermer is trying to go back there and send a message too because he, he has history in Philadelphia. I think he has the Giants job. So I believe that his ability to develop quarterbacks is very important. He's going to get Case to play an aggressive style. They have a very good defense, and he has enough tape to be able to trust Case. That's the big difference. If you ask me who's the better quarterback in this game, Case Keenum's a better quarterback right now than Nick Foles is. So I'm less concerned about Case because he has a style. Nick Foles is trying not to lose the Eagles the game. I, I agree with Chris that he, I, I mentioned earlier that in a vacuum, theoretically, it, I, would, I would love to be able to say to Case Keenum, hey, man. Just play real, you know, play real conservative. Pretend, play as if we have a 17-point lead the that's whole game. That's not managing. But that's, that's but, just taking off. Well, really. but that's also it. Seems like it's not possible. This is one of these theories that I've always had. That then I talk to Chris about, and he's like, "Okay, yeah, that sounds great, but you can't actually implement yeah, it." it sounds the, good talking to your buddies or at a bar, right? But actually, but, but don't you, play out in real sports. But that you can't implement it with real human beings who are asked to go do it. Yes, he's he's done this repetitively throughout. It, when we go back to the Case Keenum, Teddy Bridgewater discussion that we had so often, I think the way Case has played, I think Case has shown you, at least from what I'd seen most recently of Teddy, that Case's best is actually better than Teddy's best. The reason that I was so adamant I thought they'd go to Teddy at some point was because the Vikings are so great defensively. They don't need a quarterback with a, all, a ton of upside. They right. need what they the perfect quarterback for them is a game manager, not a gunslinger. It's one of the reasons why Sam Bradford worked for them last year. Well, but that also what makes this team better than any of those other teams. In the last three years, the Vikings defense has been in the top three. What results do we have from it? Nothing. The reason why the Vikings are a special team is because Case Keenum and his ability to put the ball to either one of his wide receivers that they can make big plays. These are not like the Baltimore Ravens or the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Their offense is a lot better than those offenses, and that's why I believe that this is a tremendous challenge for Philadelphia with Case Keenum. And if you would have thought two months ago, oh, we're going against Case Keenum, hmm, they would have been, been licking been their thrilled. chops. They would have been absolutely Only thrilled. Only someone could have just come up with this two months ago. Jenna, I don't think you've How mentioned that enough. that Possible. When you, when you only have one, you can go like that. You hang your, all your hats and all your clothes and everything on, on that the one peg. On that one peg. <laughs> Welcome back to First Things First. If it weren't for the unreal ending to the Vikings Saints game, the play we might all still be talking about would be that catch right there, made by Adam Thielen. And would you look at this? Who got up early to join us? This morning on our show, Adam Thielen. Adam! Yes. Applause all around. First of all, congratulations. Thank you so much for being with us on the show this morning. How are you feeling today? Uh, pretty good. I can't, can't complain. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, we're ready to get back to work, and uh, we're sick of seeing the, the Minnesota <laughs> miracle. We're ready to uh, get back to Philadelphia. Well, great news, because we're going to talk about it for yet a little bit longer. <laughs> so, uh, our, our guy CC was at the game. He was on the field. He came back. He described to us in vivid detail what was going on. What he wasn't was in uniform in that play when that actually happened. So, if you would just enlighten us a, one more time, at least, what was your reaction being on the field and watching that all unfold? Well, I really I couldn't move. I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I was in shock. Um, I was I was pretty much in the uh, Saints bench at the time, so um, they, they couldn't move. I couldn't move, and um, it was just it was unbelievable. I, I still can't even really believe it, believe it, but uh, I'm I'm ready to get back on the field again. So the I'm gonna follow up with one more about that. When you see it happen, or when the play's drawn up, I imagine it's catch it quick, get out of bounds, try to get a field goal. Did you think there was any chance at a touchdown on that play when you guys came out of the huddle? 
Uh, no, not not when we were coming out of the huddle. Um, you know, Case told us before we, we lined up, he said, hey, somebody's going to get a chance here. I'm going to give somebody a chance and uh, make a play and get out of bounds. And uh, when I saw the ball in the air, though, uh, was when I really uh, you know, felt like we had a chance to actually score uh, because there was nobody behind Diggs and, and the way that the, the safety uh, missed him. Um, I was just hoping he stayed in bounds and, and stayed on his feet uh, to score because it was a, it was pretty – Pretty uh, unbelievable. There was nobody behind him to, to have that guy's back. The one thing that we felt a little bit bad about as fans watching the game was that we weren't in the locker room to, to, to just get a sense of what that celebration felt like. So can you just describe the moments afterwards when you all finally got in there, when the euphoria was just starting to settle in and, and kind of whirl its way up? Yeah, I mean, I mean to put it in perspective, I guess, um, you know, all the work we put in uh, since OTA's training camp, uh, all the practices through the season, all the games in the season to actually have this opportunity. I, I think it all kind of just came out in the locker room like, wow, like, uh, you know, the, the work is paying off. Um, you know, the, the GMs, the coaches, everybody's hugging each other, high-fiving, and just saying, what just happened? Because uh, it all happened so fast. We, we really just kind of were in shock still, like I said before. But, uh, yeah, everybody just, uh, the emotions came out. And uh, now to have this opportunity this week, you know, um, we really got to take advantage of it because uh, what happened last week doesn't mean anything if we don't take care of business this week. After looking at the tape, I know Philadelphia, they're very, very impressive, Adam, from a defensive standpoint. They got a rotation, seven defensive linemen going out. They play some man-to-man -man coverage on the outside, also play some zone. What do you look for as far as this matchup with this Vikings offense going against this very, very good Philadelphia Eagles defense? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, for me, I, I really focus in on the secondary and um, the one thing that pops out on, on tape with this secondary is there's not a whole lot of times that receivers are catching the ball uh, in space. You know, th there, there's a lot of contested catches, um, which, which is a lot of credit to them. It means that they're covering guys extremely well. Uh, they're extremely well coached. They're in the right spots. Uh, because, like I said, there's, uh, there's very few times I've seen on film where guys are catching it wide open and, and being able to run after the catch and things like that. So, uh, we're gonna have to really, uh, we're gonna have to really come with a really good game plan and making sure that uh, we're doing the little things to to gain separation. Adam, you mentioned contested catches that there's not a lot of wide open windows. One thing you and your counterpart Stephon Diggs have been near the top of the NFL this year is those contested catches. Now those don't happen if the quarterback throwing the ball doesn't trust you guys to make those plays. How important for your guys' success has been I, the symbiosis, if you will, between Case trusting you guys to go up and making a play and you guys not letting him down by going up and completing those plays? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, it, it means a lot for Case to have trust in us, and I think that starts with practice. Um, I think Diggs and I and, and all of us as, as uh, receivers, skill position guys, um, we kind of pride ourselves on on making those plays in practice so we can gain that trust uh, in a game. And uh, it's kind of funny because uh, in the game, actually, Case came up to me after one of the, the third, down, third down catches I had, and he said, man, I didn't even see you. I just trusted you were going to get open, which is pretty cool as a receiver to hear because uh, that's what you want. You want to be given that opportunity. Um, every time you run a route, you, you run it to get open, and, and, and you want the ball in your hands. So, uh, when the quarterback has trust like that, when he can't even see you and, and he's throwing the ball and, and expecting to make a play, it's, it's pretty cool. Adam, I would imagine, and I've, I've done and I've covered Super Bowl week many times, or the title, conference titles weeks, and I, I know that the question you probably get asked more than anything is, is about Case Keenum. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of media surrounding, a lot of articles and whatnot surrounding Case Keenum and Nick Foles in this one. So I have to ask you this. Not many people were on the Case Keenum bandwagon like you guys were as a team early on in the season. And you guys were out there saying, this is our guy, this is our guy. And he did nothing but go in there and help you guys win week to week. He has gotten you to the NFC championship game right now. And, and I, I just have to ask how impressed you were with the way Case Keenum played in that playoff game last week and what you're looking forward to out of him this week. Yeah, I think uh, every week, uh, me personally and as a team, I think we're extremely, uh, we're more impressed each week. Uh, it's pretty impressive. It's impressive what he's been able to do this season, stepping in for, for Sam and, uh, you know, trying to be a leader and, and taking over this offense. And, um, you know, we're going to need him to, to keep doing those things, which we can completely trust him to do that because of the way he prepares. I mean, there's nobody, I know it's cliche to say about a quarterback that he, you know, he's the first one in here and the last one out and, um, he prepares like nobody else, but 
But it's the truth. This guy, uh, I've never seen somebody memorize a game plan uh, before the week even started. And uh, it, it's, it's just really impressive. And, and those are the things that, would, that make him successful. Uh, people think that, uh, you know, we just show up on Sundays and, and start slinging the ball around. But uh, they don't really see what he does uh, throughout the week. So you're impressed with Case as far as that you don't see that type of understanding and volume of the offense. Has that helped you guys from the offensive coordinator standpoint? He's seen how Case has played. He's got confidence in Case, and he has the whole volume of offense. All coordinators say, oh, we're going with the backup. We're going to run the same offense. But the Vikings actually are running the whole volume of offense based on what you're telling us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, I think that's allowed Coach Shermer to, to really do what he does. I think sometimes, you know, as coordinators, they can get kind of, um, you know, kind of pigeonholed and, and into certain things with having to do a ba uh, play a backup and things like that. But like I said, uh, Case has done such a good job of just kind of making this offense his own. And I think he said that early on this season. He said, um, you know, this is this is my offense now, and, and I'm going to make it my own and and try to try to get it uh, to you know to the point where I can start making checks at the line, and, and the coaches trust me to to really open it up. And like I said, that, that only helps uh, the offense coordinator and, and us as players because um, that makes us – that gives us the ability to do, to do a lot of things and make a lot of things look the same and uh, kind of, uh, you know, be able to disguise things. This was your first career divisional round playoff game. You've got Chris Carter, John Randall, a bunch of other all-time Vikings greats on the sidelines. Can you – before the game, you can really feel the importance of it. Can you tell us what that was like pregame? And if you would, because CC he won't tell me, what did he say to you after the game? Spill it. Just tell, I'll, I'll mute his mic. Just tell, <laughs> tell us both those things, please. No, you know, it was it was awesome, obviously, to see CC before the game and – and uh, yeah, after the game, it was it was a cool moment. Got to get a picture with my guy, and um, you know he just said he's proud of us. And and uh, you know us as receivers, um, even Diggs, you know, not being from Minnesota, you know he looked up to him and and the plays that he was able to make. And and those are the guys that 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 made us want to play this game and play at a high level. So um, it was really cool to see all those guys there, the alumni, um, the fans, the just the the atmosphere that that place had was just unbelievable and and everything leading up to that week with the uh, I think there was every middle school and elementary school uh, did a skull chant and sent it to us so uh, we felt the energy from around Minnesota that's for sure Adam no extra pressure but it's very very rare um, that we hear of a story like yours no scholarship opportunities not invited to the combine um, as a little boy you had a lot of dreams but a lot of those dreams included playing for the team that potentially you get a chance to go to the Super Bowl. Adam, be honest with me. What would it personally mean for you? So many people have given up on you. People said you were too small. You shouldn't play offense. All those things. To be able 60 minutes from making the Vikings potentially get the team to a point where they've never ever won the Super Bowl before. Inside as a little kid, what's it feel like? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable to think about that. Um, I think for me... Honestly, just all the work I put in, all the work that this team has put in, um, you know, you look back to how long ago OTAs seems and training camp and things like that. And uh, like I said, just all that work that you put in, that's what makes it even more special and, and what, it, what makes it even more, uh, even makes it a bigger game because uh, you don't put all that work in it. You don't do all those things. You don't, uh, you know, go through high school and try to get into college and try to make it in the NFL. You don't do all those things to, to not want to win a Super Bowl so you know that's that's the main goal that's the that's the thing you always look for every season you start the new season and that's what you want to do so obviously we know this is a big game and, and something that we've been uh, working for and striving for for a long time so uh, this opportunity doesn't come very often either so uh, we're going to try to make sure that we take advantage of that well Adam we know you do still have more work to be done it is 7 30 a.m. where you are you have a full day and a couple more days until this game we wish you the best of luck and we thank you so much for hanging out with us today Thank you so much, right. Adam. Good luck, man. Yeah, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. The NBA All-Star starters were announced yesterday in the East. LeBron leads the way with Kyrie, Giannis, Joel Embiid, and DeMar DeRozan. And in the West, the starters will be Steph Curry as your captain, my captain, followed by James Harden, KD, Anthony Davis, and DeMarcus Cousins. These are great teams. But this year, the teams will be drafted by captains LeBron, 
and stiff. So we are going to do our own little draft. We are? Yes, oh, Nick. Oh, thank I'm so, see, I hand it over, begin the draft. I know this draft. isn't really your thing, but I'm gonna, I, I asked the yeah. people before the show. If it also lets you know it's not my show. Well, it's our show. Yeah, that's it's what I know. It's our show, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely right. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and say I'm Team LeBron, you're Team Steph. Really? Is that okay with you? I, I, I'll take Steph. You'll, no okay. problem. All right, Absolutely. so LeBron has the first pick. So with the first pick of the Not only does he get LeBron's team, but he also gets LeBron the first pick. Did, is it your court? Is it your ball? I mean, like. Listen, LeBron actually does have the first pick. He got the most votes. He gets the first pick. The NBA decided that, not me. All right. I defer to you. I'm picking James Harden first. No problem. I'll take Durant. Okay. <laughs> All right. Need some silence. Anthony Davis, please. Did you I'll say take, you needed some silence? No problem. Silence. I'll, I'll take silence. Giannis. Boogie Cousins. No it, problem. I'll take Joel Embiid and Riri if you want to <laughs> reconsider the offer. And, and the big fella, he's on my team. All right? If you want to give him a little date because he's an all-star now. All right. So that means all we have left is DeMar DeRozan and Kyrie Irving. And I see what you've done here. You, you've tried to box me in. You think I won't take the best player available because of some petty personal conflict. And you know what? You know me too well. I will pick, take DeMar DeRozan. I don't need that flat earth trader Kyrie Irving on my team. No problem. So the one championship your guy got <laughs> recent was because oh! of Kyrie Irving. Oh! I'm going to take Kyrie Irving. And if you keep it up, Kyrie uh -huh. Irving. Nick hangs out the Red Rooster. You, you got to stop. Kyrie ain't hey. going to show up. Hey. A lot of people don't like me, man. Flatten his nose. <laughs> okay, well, okay. that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. All right, <laughs> so let's see. Let's see our teams. Good job with the graphics department, guys. That was fast. Oh, my team's a... Five and a half point favorite. Uh, no problem. And once you bet on them, that's going to no. go the other way. <laughs> if you know anything about no. Vegas and Nick, I okay. like my squad. Yeah, but Steph who? Durant, Giannis, Joel Embiid. You don't got Come enough get size. Some. You don't got enough size. Put you in the torture. It's the new NBA. Yeah. How many shooters you got? What? Oh, Harden? What? No, don't say what. I got Harden. That's all I know. I got Harden. I yeah. got some size. LeBron's also his free throw shooting starting going back the other uh, way. Listen, I know he missed which, five. Which in a row team last is going to play better defense? Oh, it's the All Star game. So. Yeah, there's no, not going to no, be a lot of defense. No, it's no. going to be 308 it's Los Angeles. to 300. No, we got we got to put on the show because there is no showtime with the Lakers. So the All Star game. <laughs> Who, can I ask you the question real quick before we move on? I put, took James Harden number one. LeBron does have the number one pick. He can't pick Steph because Steph is the other captain. Who do you think LeBron will pick? Man, I got n I got no clue. I wouldn't be surprised if he picked Durant. The if he picks Harden, the the inkling that LeBron might end up in Houston next year will get louder. If he goes with Harden over Durant, because he can't pick a teammate because he doesn't have a teammate on here, Durant's obviously the best player available. If he goes with Harden over Durant, whether it's fair or not, people will start to echo that sentiment that he might end up in Houston. Good. If he takes Joel Embiid, he believes in the process. Maybe he's <laughs> headed to Philly. There that would go. be a major upset. Uh, that would be, if he takes Joel Embiid with his first pick, then I think we should bet that he's going to Philly. Uh, on paper, guys, the Cleveland Cavaliers own the Orlando Magic. They've beaten them 19 of their last 20 times. But last night's win was anything other than celebratory. Cavs found a way to blow a 23-point lead. In the third quarter, they missed all nine threes and shot Six of 20 overall. But due to a fluky last few seconds, they eked out the win. Here's LeBron after the game. We want to play better, and we know we have the ability to do it. But right now, we're in Strugglesville. So. But it felt like a win. We needed it. Definitely. It's a cerebral answer from a cerebral-looking fella after yeah. that game there. Nick, what was the most concerning part about this Cavs' very narrow escape last night? I mean, they were terrible in the second half. <laughs> It was as bad of a second half, or as bad of a half as they've played in a win. It was the worst half of basketball they've played in a win since the first half of the Knicks game you and I went to. Remember that when they, mm -hmm. uh, they were awful, they ended up right. coming back at the end? Right. We feel differently about games where teams play poorly in the first half and then play great in the second half. Like That would be an encouraging sign. There's very little to be encouraged about from last night's game. LeBron, who's usually the one constant on the team, mm -hmm. was awful. Like, by he was awful by his standards, and he was below average just by really good player standards. And he had a couple perplexing turnovers late in the game. He missed his first five free throws of the game. Kevin Love continues to look like a different guy in games Isaiah Thomas plays in. Derrick Rose came back and looked just like the Derrick Rose from before the injury, which was an unplayable Derrick Rose. That's not a You didn't compliment. think he looked better than that? Unplayable? Man, he had I, nine points in 13 minutes. I just, I, I, Rose, uh, I, 
I watch Rose and I feel like he look of a team that doesn't seem to be good defensively. He looks particularly lost defensively, and to me, he can only get his points in transition. Like in transition, he can get his points. Like I just Rose. If Rose is a part of their rotation. I think that's a bad sign. So, no, there weren't a lot of encouraging signs to me, even though they got the victory. I thought Isaiah, in playing almost 30 minutes, was more explosive. He was more sudden. He looked like he knew what he wanted to do. Also, I felt like even though Cleveland did lose the big lead, um, which yeah, I don't like that, but I saw some in-game situations that I'd like to be able to see them. I saw them lose the league late. I saw them trying to, when they had a go-to play, I didn't know what they would do with IT on the court with LeBron for the first time. They went pick and roll with LeBron and IT. So that can be a winning formula for them. So getting those reps, Isaiah getting into the lane, being drawing the foul, hitting the free throws, which end up being the game winner. To me, I saw some positive things because IT was playing in critical minutes. He's almost up to 30 minutes a game. And I saw some suddenness and the half court, what they decide to run at the end of the game, I believe will pay them dividends down the road. Is the most important thing now moving forward for the Cavaliers just to get Isaiah Thomas back into game shape, in a rotation, make sure he's healthy and get him playing? Is it just Isaiah Thomas should be the focus? Well, it is. Th that is the primary focus. But as soon as that happens, they need to figure out a way to get the best out of Kevin Love with Isaiah Thomas on the court. Like, the, the, the reality is, if Kevin Love is your second best player, you're going to have a really hard time winning a title. So you need Isaiah to be your second-best player, and you need Kevin Love to be a very good option as your third option. And, I mean, we can show it, like, Love with and without IT. The points are per 100 possessions. It's 32 to 21. His shooting percentage dips by, what is that, 15%? His field goal percentage dips by 5%, nearly 6%. Like, Love has just been a different guy with Isaiah Thomas on the court, and that's something they have to fix. Like, that, they, they cannot... Go ahead, Jenna. No, it just seems like there's no, there's no there's no solutions that are out. The only solution seems to be either stuff him in there and try to make it work, or it doesn't work. I, I don't see... It's not an option for Kevin Love to be the second option. No, though, there, there is a solution, and that's him playing more time. Isaiah Thomas is not a point guard. He is what you call a scoring guard. That means he might not run the offense as efficient as a true point guard, but he's going to be able to score the ball basketball, score the ball more than typically a point guard, too. You also have to realize LeBron was the point before. He, he's at an all-time high as far as assists. LeBron is great at getting players in the position that they love to score the ball the most. So that's the compromise now. He went from LeBron was his point guard, getting in the ball where he was featured the number one option on the offense compared to IT where he is the third option and we're trying to get IT involved in the game. So that's where the Cavs are right now. LeBron James is a better point guard than Isaiah Thomas, and it's affected the rest of the offense. That part will come back around because LeBron, when they get in critical situations, him and IT will split the ball handling duty. Do you see a scenario whereby this team can be successful? No. With Kevin Love is the I will not finish my sentence question. Go, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Jeez, do you see a, a situation where this team can be successful if Kevin Love is your second option and Isaiah Thomas is not? No. no. I'll pause. No. So then Isaiah Thomas has to be the biggest priority right now to get up and running. Because the NBA, where it is right now, look who Golden State has. Traymond, Clay, Durant, and Steph. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have four legitimate superstar players. So you can't be like, is Kevin Love, is he good enough? He's not good enough on the offensive and the defensive end okay. to be able to match up with those players. They, the, if Love were a top ten player in the league, then maybe the solution would be, listen, we're going to do a LeBron-Love combo. IT, I know this isn't what you wanted. You're going to come off the bench. You're going to be our energy off the bench, scorer off the bench. But a LeBron-Love combo where Kevin Love is in his career, even when he's playing as well as he was a month ago, is not good enough to beat the Golden State Warriors in seven games. So that's why they have to – you were right, Jenna. The primary focus has to be getting Isaiah Thomas to where he looks like Isaiah Thomas. And that's why – Even having Kyrie as the number two option was not enough to beat Golden State. 
Right. So and Kyrie is a better player than Kevin Love, and, and and that's why it last night took 15 shots. The game before he led the team in shots. They are sacrificing some efficiency to get it back into rhythm, to get it back into shape. Once they feel like okay, he's as close to full strength as he's going to be, then they can start actually working on things. Another thing that's important to note is as CC talks about all the time, NBA teams don't practice that much. They, there's a lot of travel. There's a lot of games. It, one of the Ty Lu said before this game. It's a lot we of fake fighting, too. <laughs> okay. We <laughs> actually got to do some practicing. And it, you saw early in the game they looked a little bit better. But these guys just haven't played a lot of minutes together, a lot of reps together. So I, as far as you know, the question, anything to be encouraged or are their most concerning part about the game last night, the most concerning part is – while they're working through these things, they still don't have the attention to detail to hold a lead against Orlando. The thing about Cleveland <laughs> Excuse me, is, I is they are an old basketball team. And you could see that when they had the big lead. Young teams that are athletic, a lot like Orlando, are able to get back into the game. If they're not making a shot, people say it is a make or miss league. Yes, but it's also those other teams that don't make or miss, they have defense on their side. The Cavs don't have that as a holding card. So right. when they are missing shots, they are around the middle of the pack as far as NBA as far as the quality of team that they're going to put on the floor. Yeah, and my, just my last question will be, I understand what, now that you've explained it, what this strategy is in sacrificing a couple of things to make sure IT gets in there. But then you have the other side of it, which is the entire conversation we had yesterday. This team's frustrated. This team's tired. Uh, LeBron James is annoyed, and he's getting he's all, getting. That, that's all star game and the trade deadline cure all those woes. So the trade they're going to add a piece of the trade deadline. Everyone's going to get a break at the all star game, and they're going to finally be able to see the finish line. Mentally, I'm not worried about this Cavs team. Mentally, if you people remember, we talked about January last year. The last two weeks of last year, people were worried about them. They looked tired. They, Boston got the one seed, then they came out and they swept the first two rounds of the playoffs. That's not a real to me a real concern once the playoffs you can actually see them in. Your Jenna, he's wrong. I'm wrong? I let him get to the end, but he, but he's wrong. They're, they're gonna, but at least you let him get they, to the end. They're going to so. keep struggling. I actually knew what the question was. You too. did? Yeah, about Kevin Love being the number two. <laughs> the, but hold on. They're going to say what you said again? I just want to understand it. They're going to keep – you think they're going to still continue to mentally and emotionally go through these things we're talking about right now late in the year when the playoffs are coming up? Um, before I think they're going to continue to struggle the rest of the season. Okay. All right.